replacement for you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you and our good friends from C-SPAN to the McGowan Theater, located in the National Archives Building in Washington, DC. I'm Doug Swanson, Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum and producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Today's noon author talk is being presented in conjunction with our current exhibit, Spirited Republic, Alcohol in American History. Since the first European settlers, Americans have enjoyed a drink. At times, many of us have enjoyed a lot of drinks. But other Americans, fearing the harm alcohol would do to society and to individuals, have tried to stop our drinking or limit who, when, and where we could consume alcohol. These two different views of alcoholic beverages run throughout American history. Sometimes they have existed in relative peace. Other times they have been at war. Spirited Republic uses National Archives documents and artifacts to show how government programs and policies have changed over time and to illustrate the wide variety of views about alcohol held by Americans. The stories they tell echo today's debate over regulating drinking and the legalization of other drugs. The exhibit will be open until January 10th, 2016 and is located in the uh, Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery on the main exhibit level. Over the next four months or so, the National Archives will continue to present Spirited Republic author talks, panel discussions, films, and wine and whiskey tastings, which have been very popular. <laughs> to find out more about these upcoming programs and the exhibit, please take one of our monthly event calendars, which you will find in the theater lobby, or you can visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. Our topic for today is the year of fear, Machine Gun Kelly and the Manhunt that Changed the Nation by Joe Urschel. Joe Urschel is Executive Director of the National Law Enforcement Museum in Washington, D.C. He's an award-winning journalist and television documentary producer with 25 years experience in the news business. He was part of the editing team that conceived and launched USA Today in 1982 and held a variety of positions at the paper, including senior correspondent, managing editor, an op-ed columnist where he covered a variety of political and social issues. He served as supervising producer of the paper's syndicated television production, USA Today on TV. Urschel led the team of historians, journalists, and producers that conceived, designed, and created the Museum, the Museum of News Events and History, located on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and served as its executive director from 1996 to 2011. Urschel is the former chairman of the George Foster Peabody Awards, the nation's oldest award program for electronic media, and currently serves as a member of the National Advisory Board of the College of Media at the University of Illinois, his alma mater. His journalism honors include awards from the National Association of Newspaper Columnists and the National Association of Sunday and Feature Editors. He won an Emmy Award for a news documentary on campus crime that he wrote and co-produced. Please join me in welcoming Joe Urschel to the National Archives. Thank you.
Thank you, Doug. Um, I must say I'm disappointed, though, that there's no uh, wine and whiskey for this event. <laughs> um, had I known, I would have brought my own. Well, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, I appreciate you stopping by. I, um, I will try to refrain myself from droning on and on for too long so that I reserve some time for questions if you have any. Um, so I think we have about uh, 45 minutes time, uh, about 30 minutes into this. If you're feeling like you really have a question you'd like to ask, you can just flag me and I'll uh, start that part of the program. Um, I, I first would like to uh, explain a little bit of how I got into this uh, story and this book. Uh, as Doug said, I came here in uh, 1982 for the launch of USA Today. Uh, and very excited to be in Washington. Uh, I was taking in all the tourist sites, of course, including the Library of Congress and its uh, beautiful stately reading room. And this is 1982, and the Library of Congress had just converted its card cataloging system over to a digital database, which um, uh, patrons could use when they were visiting. So. Uh, kind of on a lark, I went over to the uh, computer keyboard and typed in my last name, uh, which is fairly uncommon, or at least it was uncommon until the uh, uh, Baltimore Ravens drafted John Urschel, <laughs> who is not only now more famous than me, but uh, also a lot smarter. Uh, if you don't know anything about him, he, he, he's probably the only person in the uh, NFL who's working on his PhD while he's playing. Uh, he's a mathematician. But anyway, uh, when, I, when I put in my name, there was one, one entry that popped up. Keep in mind, this is the Library of Congress, the world's greatest collection of knowledge. Uh, and, it, and the entry was Charles Urschel, kidnapping victim. And uh, there was one book uh, written about it and it was called Crime's Paradise, The Authentic Inside Story of the Urschel Kidnapping. So intrigued, I of course called it up and uh, sat down and read it cover to cover. Uh, and it was the most remarkable story. I mean, it read like a Dashiell Hammett novel. I mean, it had, it had more twists and turns in it uh, than you could possibly imagine. And I was just flabbergasted because I had never heard of this guy. Uh, and basically, I hadn't heard of any Urschels in the country, really, other than the ones I was related to, most of whom lived in Albany, New York. Uh, so after I read the book, uh, I, I, you know, I called up my dad and I said, you know, I just read this incredible book about Charles Urschel, this uh, oil millionaire in Texas who got kidnapped in the 1930s. Uh, are we related to him? And like without a second thought, he said, uh, no, we're not. I, I said, well, how do you know? He goes, just we're not. <laughs> so um, like, like any good son, I immediately set out to prove my father wrong <laughs> and you know, embarked on some genealogical research and was looking all over the country for Urschels. And uh, I probably shouldn't admit this at the archives, but I never did find a connection uh, the connection, there was no connection really that I could find uh, within the United States. Uh, if there is any connection, it dates back uh, centuries to Saxony, which is now Germany. So um, with that, I decided, well, it's still a good story. And I just began collecting string on it over the last uh, 30 years or so. And, and the more I learned about it, the better the story got. Uh, it, it's, it's an incredible story about the most, one of the most remarkable kidnappings uh, in American history. Uh, it produced the largest manhunt in the nation up until that time. Uh, the manhunt covered 16 states, 20,000 miles. Uh, it resulted in a sensational trial that was covered daily by the press from around the world and recorded on motion picture cameras and shown in movie theaters week after week. Uh, part of the sensational nature of that coverage resulted in federal trials 
banning cameras for the next uh, probably 50 years. Uh, and even now, they're only used on an experimental basis. Uh, it launched the FBI and gave its agents their nickname, G-Men. It resulted in the establishment of Alcatraz as a federal penitentiary, as a home for criminals who were deemed vicious and irredeemable, the worst of the worst. It sped the passage of the Federal Crime Bill of 1934, which made kidnapping a federal crime punishable by death and greatly expanded the powers of the FBI. All of this was made possible by the remarkable cooperation of Charles Urschel, kidnap victim. The story takes place in 1933, uh, which is what I've deemed the year of fear, uh, primarily because the year contains this incredible confluence of events uh, that are taking place. It, 1933, in 1933, we're three years into the Great Depression. Uh, it's probably the worst year, the worst economic consequences are being played out across the nation as the uh, economy sinks further and further. Um, in the years since the 1929 crash, the market had lost almost 90% of its value. The unemployment rate for non-farm farm workers was up to 40%. In some cities, it stretched as high as 80%. Thousands of banks were closed. The loss of tax revenues necessitated draconian cuts in the social services, the few social services that uh, did exist. Municipal workers, police, and teachers were laid off or went unpaid. Thousands of schools closed. Millions of students just dropped out. At the same time, catastrophic dust storms were beginning to kick up across the Southwest and the Midwest, later to become uh, what we refer to now as the Dust Bowl. And these were incredible storms that would start in New Mexico or Oklahoma or Texas. And uh, they'd blow so hard and so strong with so much fine silt that the people who lived in that area would have to do things like drape their uh, uh, their child's beds and um, carriages with wet sheets just to prevent the uh, silt from coming in and choking them to death. It, it would kill livestock in the fields. It would blow so far that it would turn the uh, snow red in New England. Ships at sea who were coming into New York Harbor would encounter it, unable to see the skyline. <clears throat> um, You can see some of the uh, effects of the, wh what these storms would do on local farms. And while, while the dust storms were kicking up and the economy was tanking, a sense of lawlessness was beginning to abound throughout the country. Machine gunners had just assassinated four law enforcement officers in broad daylight in the parking lot of Kansas City's Union Station. And violent gangs of bank robbers and thieves were operating with virtual impunity along what they called the criminal corridor, which stressed, stretched from Dallas, Texas to St. Paul, Minnesota. Anton Cermak was assassinated. Anton Cermak, the mayor of Chicago, was standing next to FDR at a political event when he was assassinated in Miami. Uh, it's, we now think that the assassination attempt was uh, directed at FDR but at the time, FDR thought the assassination attempt was successful and that Cermak was indeed uh, the victim because uh, Cermak had just unseated uh, Fred Thompson, the mayor of Chicago. Thompson had formed kind of an unholy alliance with Al Capone and his uh, criminal empire in Chicago. Cermak came in on a vow to rid the city of Capone, and the way he was going to do that was to ally himself with another gang known as the Terrible Tuies, who were operating on the north side of the city. And he literally had hired uh, some of Tuies' men to be his police officers and bodyguards. And they had made an assassination attempt just weeks earlier on Frank Nitti, who was Capone's um, chief lieutenant. So, while this is all going on, uh, prohibition is about to end. 
And the elimination of prohibition eliminates one of the criminal empire's most lucrative sources of money. Um, so with the banks drying up, uh, the bank robbing business isn't as good as it used to be. And with prohibition coming to an end, um, they're looking for other ways to make money. What happens in uh, the three years since the uh, uh, market failure is an incredible spate of kidnappings begin occurring across the country. Uh, an estimated 2,000 kidnappings had occurred between 1930 and uh, 1933, uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, kidnapping case being probably the most famous. Um, so with no money left in the banks and uh, their, their sideline business of running liquor drying up, uh, the, the folks operating out west were looking for new ways to make money and uh, kidnapping wealthy individuals seemed to be a good way to do it. And the way that these operations would work is they would snatch a wealthy individual, hide him out across the state or county line uh, where uh, state police, uh, county sheriffs could not chase them. They lose their authority once they meet, leave their municipality. Um, and so it was relatively easy to hide out somebody in a remote farm uh, across the state line, uh, ransom them for uh, a certain amount of money, and then release them with the caveat that um, everything would be fine unless they go to the authorities. Uh, if they do go to the authorities, the threat was that we'll return and kill you, not only you, but all the members of your family as well. So um, the kidnapping scourge was working pretty well up until 1933 and uh, Charles Urschel. Uh, people in, uh, in Hollywood were driving around in armor-plated uh, uh, limousines with armed guards in the passenger seat. Uh, companies were issuing kidnapping insurance. Uh, and while all this is going on, of course, FDR takes office and announces that we have nothing to fear but fear itself when at the very same time uh, Adolf Hitler was uh, appointed chancellor in Germany. So these are tough times in the US uh, with tougher times coming. Um, so in the midst of this uh, incredible scenario, George Kelly and his glamorous wife decide that they are going to kidnap the richest oil man in the Southwest. And with an almost remarkable lack of planning, Kelly and his partner, Albert Bates, burst into the Urschel home at 11.30 one hot July evening when Urschel and his wife are playing bridge with their friends, Walter Jarrett and his wife. So Kelly, armed with a machine gun, and Bates, armed with a 45, kick in the door, run up to the bridge game, and suddenly discover that they don't know which of the two guys is Urschel. <laughs> so making all kinds of threats, they, uh, they demand that Urschel reveal himself, which he doesn't do. He just sits there, and so does Walter. Uh, so as, as uh, Kelly and Bates are getting increasingly belligerent, uh, Walter decides that he's going to stand up and be a hero. So he begins to stand up, at which point Urschel begins to stand up too. And uh, so Kelly says, okay, forget it, we'll take both of you. They put him in the car and they speed off into the night. Uh, a couple miles out of town, uh, they realize that they could probably identify which one was Urschel by emptying their wallets. Uh, <laughs> so they stop the car, they get the wallets, uh, they take all of uh, Jarrett's money, they give him 10 bucks to get a cab back to town and they take off with uh, Urschel. They take him out to a farm owned by, in, in uh, Wise County, Texas, just outside of Dallas. The farm is owned by Catherine Kelly's father-in-law, a guy known uh, around town as Boss. Uh, it, it's sort of a sad, broken down farm uh, with a few animals uh, where Boss lives with his wife and uh, his son and his son's wife. So they stick Urschel in, uh, they, they blindfold him. They, he's been blindfolded for the entire ride. They cover his ears with cotton and tape them shut. And for the next eight days, 
he is basically uh, blind and deaf and chained to a, uh, a high chair, actually, or a bed frame at various times of the day. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he's the kind of guy who does not part with his money very willingly. And he's bound and determined that if he ever gets out, he's going to come back and find these guys and get his money back. So he begins collecting information about where he is. Uh, he knows how long the car ride took, but uh, he also realizes that they were going in a circuitous route uh, designed to confuse him. But this is a guy who's been working his whole career for uh, a fellow named Tom Slick, who is known as the king of the wildcatters. Uh, so he's been, he and Urschel have been finding oil all over Oklahoma and Texas, and they know just about every inch of that territory, backward and forward. So Urschel, who grew up as, uh, on a farm in the Midwest, uh, realizes, of course, that he's on a farm. He begins counting the number of different animals, uh, finds out how many there are, uh, how many milking cows there are, all kinds of information on, on the farm itself. He, he walks the room he's held in. Uh, at various times, he collects information from the people who are holding him about what other buildings are around, how, uh, um, how big the farm is, what the postman's name is, uh, who the local prostitute is. Um, and while he's doing all this, over the course of eight days, he realizes that at 9.30 in the morning and at 5.30 at night, a plane is passing overhead. So he puts all that in the data bank while he's leaving his fingerprints all over anywhere he possibly can. In the meantime, um, his wife has collected the money for the ransom and has paid it off. And so at the point they're about to release Urschel, Catherine Kelly, who is who is really the tougher of the two characters, insists that they got to kill him. And, uh, and uh, George, of course, is saying, don't we, I mean, we can't, we can't kill him. If, if we kill him, they're going to come after us with the, the US Marines. We'll never get away. And plus, we won't be able to kidnap anybody else because our threats will, will be empty. Uh, and their plan was to kidnap five more people, ransom them at $200,000 each which is about uh, eight to 10 million in contemporary dollars, and uh, retire as millionaires in uh, Juarez, Mexico. Um, everybody's got their dreams, right? <laughs> um, so that plan uh, is eventually thwarted, and they do release Urschel, who uh, returns to his home in Oklahoma City, which uh, by then, of course, is surrounded by hordes of press from around the world, and uh, motion picture cameras from the newsreel photographers, and uh, various uh, members of the Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover's group, uh, as well as some uh, local police. Urschel uh, comes in and immediately is debriefed by uh, an FBI agent known as Gus Jones, uh, who just listens to this data dump and uh, having started out telling him that finding these kidnappers would be like finding a needle in a haystack, after 90 minutes of talking to Charles, he said, well, we just got a really small haystack. <laughs> um, so consequently, they, uh, Urschel borrows a plane from one of his oil friends. They go up in the air. They fly the route that the uh, uh, airline that they've identified had flown. They look down using Urschel's sketch of what he thinks the farm looks like. They identify a farm that uh, looks exactly like the drawing. Uh, they put together a raiding party. Uh, Urschel insists that he be in the lead car, the raiding party, with a sawed-off shotgun on his lap. Uh, and in the middle of the night, they burst in, or early in the morning, they burst in, and uh, they arrest the Shannons. And um, a fellow named Harvey Bailey, who was staying at the farm, kind of hiding out after his escape from uh, uh, state prison in Kansas. Harvey Bailey is 
an incredible character uh, in this book that I'm so, just so fortunate happened to stumble into this story because it gives me all kinds of great uh, side stories to tell. Harvey Bailey was considered the most successful bank robber in American history. He was a guy who basically invented the modern form of bank robbing, which uh, involves a lot of careful planning, uh, determining what the best escape routes are, riding the escape routes, having multiple backup plans, uh, figuring out when there's the most money in the bank to be robbed uh, by studying the local economy and the county tax records, uh, what the police activity is like, how far away the police station is, what kind of cars the police, police have, if they have any. Uh, and basically, if Harvey was planning your bank robbery, it was going to go well, and nobody was going to know who did it. And part of his MO was the fact that he would never, ever admit to uh, having robbed a bank or try to take credit for anything. Uh, as a result, he successfully robbed the Denver Mint. He robbed the Lincoln uh, National Bank of so much money that the bank failed the next day. Um, he did so well in the 20s that um, by the late 20s, he retired from the uh, bank robbing business and uh, uh, opened a series of gas stations and car washes in Chicago, uh, <laughs> but lost all his money in the uh, market crash and had to go back to the business that he, uh, that he knew so well. So he, he had worked with George Kelly on a number of bank jobs uh, and in fact had lent uh, George $1,000 when George was low on funds. So after, the kid, after he heard about the kidnapping, he went down to the farm in Wise County uh, to collect the money that uh, George owed him and to nurse a wound that he sustained when he was escaping from prison. He just happens to be sleeping in the backyard uh, on a cot when uh, Gus Jones and Urschel arrive with their squadron of law enforcement. So even though, uh, even though George and Catherine had already fled the scene uh, along with Albert Bates, uh, they'd gone up to St. Paul to launder their money, um, the uh, FBI agents still score an important victory here by pulling in Harvey Bailey, uh, who's not only a bank robber, but he's an escaped uh, prisoner. So. The, the, the raid is considered a huge success, um, and it arrives just in time for J. Edgar Hoover, who in 1933 was not yet director of the FBI. Uh, in fact, he was barely holding on to his job. He had been, uh, the, the Bureau of Investigation, as it was called then, had been given the job of solving the uh, Lindbergh kidnapping, and they had done a, a fairly miserable job, and they had made almost no progress in the 18 months since it happened. Um, when FDR took office, uh, his first choice for attorney general uh, was a guy named Thomas Walsh, senator from Wyoming. Walsh had a long and bad history with J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, during the Harding administration, Hoover and the Bureau had been instructed to uh, besmirch both um, Walsh and his fellow Senator uh, Wheeler, from, uh, both from Wyoming, these, these two were trying to um, launch an investigation of the Harding administration and uncover some of the scandals that later evolved. But J. Edgar Hoover's job was to, um, well, you know, he tapped his phone and uh, he read his mail and he tried to entrap him in a hotel room with a, a woman to get incriminating evidence on him none of which succeeded, but it did succeed in making a lifelong enemy of Mr. Walsh, who was announced by FDR as his first choice for attorney general. Uh, and after that announcement, Walsh vowed to get rid of that miserable son of a bitch, J. Edgar Hoover, as soon as he got to town. Now, unfortunately, uh, Walsh was 72 years old, and before he got to town, he went down to Miami and married a Cuban debutante. And on the train ride back to Washington, uh, when the train stopped in North Carolina, uh, Walsh's wife woke up, but he did not. And subsequently, the next attorney general was a guy named Homer, Homer Cummings, uh, who was one of uh, FDR's brain trust, uh, who was 
originally slated to be ambassador to the Philippines, but Cummings takes over the Justice Department and he's one of FDR's real go-getters and he figures the way that he can uh, raise the profile of the Justice Department, which was held in fairly low repute at the time, um, it was referred to as the Department of Easy Virtue. Uh, he decides that he's going to um, ship this place up and go and prosecute a war on crime. You know, the FDR was, was prosecuting, a, you know, a, a war on this, a war on that, a war on everything, and he really liked the militaristic sound of that, and he wanted to use the FBI uh, to, to, break, to break up basically this criminal alley and, and anything else he could do. So um, J. Edgar is under a lot of pressure at this time to, to bring in some big score, and it looks like the uh, machine gun Kelly case could be the one. There is Charles, the other uh, leading character in the story. Uh, Charles, as I said, was a farm kid, uh, grew up, enlisted in the uh, army during the First World War, and uh, when he got out, uh, was bound and determined that the last thing he was going to do any more of was farming. It was just too hard work, and uh, it was, didn't really uh, pay off as well as he was hoping, so he strikes out for Oklahoma. and decides to try to make his fortune in the oil business. Uh, he's got a real head for numbers. He's got a great memory, as, uh, as you well know. And he hooks up with uh, Tom Slick, the aptly named Tom Slick, who rapidly becomes the king of the wildcatters, and they make their fortunes together. Um, unfortunately, right at the peak of their oil business, um, Tom Slick, at four, age 47, uh, kind of your classic type A behavior guy, has a massive heart attack and dies. Um, Charles then marries his widow, forming the Urschel Slick Oil Company, <laughs> which uh, is even bigger than the Tom Slick Company. And of course, that generates a lot of headlines in the paper about how rich these folks are and, uh, and what their oil holdings entail. All of this was the uh, interesting reading that got Catherine Kelly thinking about kidnapping Charles Urschel. Um, so uh, Urschel and Slick, who, who had no great love for the press before uh, the kidnapping, uh, because they were always talking about their business affairs and their oil fines, uh, suddenly um, has even more reason to despise them. So. Um, Charles goes into an alliance with J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, there's the home where the kidnapping occurs. And Hoover then prosecutes a nationwide search for Catherine and, and, uh, and George. They, uh, the FBI had just been given the sole responsibility for chasing kidnappers across state lines. Uh, and so, they were really the only organization that, that, could, that could bring this to fruition. But there were two problems that they still had. One was the fact that they were not an armed police force. Uh, they were not trained in weapons. Most of them were um, lawyers and accountants who would help local municipalities prosecute uh, criminal investigations. So Hoover looked around his um, agencies across the country to try to find uh, people who would be skilled enough to go up against machine gunners and shotgun wielders, bank robbers, murderers, and, and, and whatnot. And he discovers that he's got fewer than 12 out of a force of 336. Uh, so he puts those guys together and puts this investigation in order, and it's run by uh, Gus Jones, who had worked in uh, Texas, kind of a legendary lawman. Uh, and this is a, a, a document produced by the, uh, F, or by the Bureau after the successful prosecution of the case, uh, which they used to further demonstrate their need for expanded powers. Uh, you can see all of the cities where they suspected um, uh, the Kellys might be and where they had tracked them. And in fact, they, they had been in 
in most of those places other than the ones on the West Coast, uh, one of the things they did was try to close the borders because they thought they'd be uh, leaving one way or another. Um, not a bad assumption. This is another um, uh, document produced by the FBI which just sort of mapped out the most prominent members of society who had been kidnapped. Um, this is the, the, the famous Melvin Purvis, the uh, special agent in charge of the Chicago office. Purvis is the agent who uh, got captured and killed John Dillinger, bringing great fame to the uh, Bureau. However, on the Urschel case, he let Kelly slip through his fingers um, uh, in Chicago. The FBI had, had discovered that uh, Kelly was using a place called the Michigan Tavern as his sort of postal address and a place where he would go and hang out and would enjoy special protection from the local police. Uh, and he assigned Purvis to uh, stake out the Michigan Tavern and try to snatch him. Uh, but literally, Purvis just forgot to do it. And uh, by the time he remembered he was supposed to do it, he sent two agents, uh, but they never went inside. And at, on that very day, Kelly was inside arranging to get a new automobile to uh, escape to Memphis, Tennessee. And um, this did not make the director happy. And you may be aware that uh, Melvin Purvis left the agency you know, a few years after all of these great events were occurring. Um, so ultimately, they chase, uh, after, after about six to seven weeks on the road, they find Kelly in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, successfully arrest him. Uh, there he is walking out of the courthouse in chains, uh, guarded by machine gunners. The FBI has now acquired quite an arsenal, and uh, they deployed them uh, uh, very prominently during the trial uh, and afterward. The interesting thing about uh, Memphis is that Kelly started out in Memphis, Tennessee. He was the child of uh, upper middle class parents. Uh, he was a caddy at the local country club. He's a pretty smart kid, uh, but he did not enjoy a very good relationship with his father, whom he hated. Um, and when he caught his father in a tryst with another woman, he basically blackmailed him and said, I won't tell mom about this. This is when he's in high school. If you give me the family car and uh, increase my allowance by X amount of money, which Kelly then used his new transportation and his money to hop across the border to Arkansas, which was a wet state, Tennessee was dry, and that's when he started his liquor running business as a... Uh, young entrepreneur in high school. And things basically went downhill from there. Um, here is uh, Catherine and George in federal court. Um, you know, they look a little bloated from seven weeks on the road when they were going through about three or four gin bottles a day. And uh, Kelly has already been uh, pistol whipped by the FBI right in the courtroom in view of all of the spectators. Uh, when he attempted to defend Catherine from what he thought was an advance by an FBI agent. Uh, you can maybe see the knot on his forehead there uh, from uh, one of the wounds he sustained. And uh, this is Alcatraz where he ended up. Uh, Homer Cummings and uh, J. Edgar Hoover had a special contempt for uh, the federal prison system, which they thought was um, too fluid, too easy to escape from, too corrupted, uh, you know, too coddling of prisoners, whatever. Um, and so they wanted to create a prison that nobody could escape from, that only the worst of the worst would be sent to, um, and there would be no attempt at rehabilitation. It would be solely for confinement. They would be cut off from the outside world. They wouldn't be allowed to talk to one another. Uh, there was all, it was just a new uh, special kind of hell for these 103 prisoners that they de deemed to be the worst in the uh, nation, people like Al Capone, um, various Midwestern murderers and thieves. Um, so George 
Kelly ends up at, in, in the introductory class going to Alcatraz prison um, where he lives out most of the rest of his life. Uh, Catherine Kelly was sent to a women's prison. Um, she managed to get out in the late 50s. Uh, Harvey Bailey ends up with uh, George on Alcatraz. Uh, he's later released uh, into a state prison. And uh, Charles, at that, by that point, uh, had sort of softened on the, on the whole affair. And uh, he went to uh, FDR and Hoover and said, look, Harvey Bailey had nothing to do with this kidnapping. You know, we ought to let him out. So he agrees to probation for Harvey and sets him up as a, uh, in Joplin, Missouri with a job as a cabinet maker and gets him a room at the YMCA where he lived out uh, the rest of his life uh, without committing another crime. Um, the Urschels end up um, intact, uh, though fairly rattled. Uh, they spent uh, the rest of their lives um, as, you know, uh, running their oil business. They set up a number of uh, foundations, uh, Biochemical Research Foundation in Texas, which is quite uh, famous. Um, but they didn't really feel all that comfortable uh, in uh, Texas in the Wild West anymore and spent a lot of time traveling through Europe collecting art um, and lived happily ever after. But uh, part of what, part of what uh, Charles experienced uh, made him detest publicity of any kind. And so he instructed the rest of his family uh, and anybody that would listen to him, that you, you should never get any publicity whatsoever, no matter what you've done, no matter how proud you are of it. Uh, you, you should remain as concealed as possible, otherwise bad things will happen to you. Uh, and that attitude was not only passed down to his children, but to his grandchildren as well, and to the grandchildren of everybody involved in this case, uh, even to the point where when I got around to finding them and trying to talk to them, they were very circumspect. Uh, and the only way I think that I got any kind of cooperation whatsoever from them uh, was because of uh, the, the same last name and the fact that at some point we're probably related. Uh, and and uh, uh, Charles's granddaughter, uh, who lives in Texas, was, I probably shouldn't tell you that, uh, was especially helpful uh, ultimately. And uh, uh, we enjoyed some, some good chats and emails together and she shared with me most of the uh, things that she had collected about the case. The other uh, interesting thing about this particular case and J. Edgar Hoover uh, was that while Hoover was maybe not the best lawman uh, in the country at the time, he did understand public relations and publicity. Uh, and he was just beside himself with Hollywood because Hollywood at the time was glamorizing gangsters, basically. In 1930, the number one movie in the country was, uh, in 1933, I'm sorry, was um, Scarface, starring James Cagney. Scarface is about a character uh, based on Al, uh, Al Capone, almost said Al Pacino. Um, <laughs> and uh, so Hoover knew that if he was going to be successful uh, with, his, with his agents as a law enforcement agency, he was gonna have to create them as heroes. He didn't want the gangsters to be the heroes anymore. He wanted his agents to be the heroes. And he personally went to James Cagney and, and complained and said, you ought, to, you ought to star in something that uh, makes a hero out of a law enforcement officer. Uh, and basically, at the time, there was a big uh, kind of public revulsion at these gangster movies that were growing increasingly violent, um, if you can believe that. And uh, so the, the Hollywood, fearing that there would be some kind of uh, censorship imposed by the government, creates their own kind of rating system. And um, uh, one of the things that they outlaw is gangster movies. 
Uh, they try to get the, the entire industry not to produce them. Um, but Hoover manages to get one caveat um, put into the code, and that's that if you're going to make a gangster movie, you have to have an FBI agent in it. And if you're going to have an FBI agent in, in your movie, J. Edgar Hoover has got to approve the script. So in 1935, G-Men comes out with James Cagney as a uh, FBI agent who solves a kidnapping. And there are three or four movies right after that with the same kind of scenario, with the same kind of FBI hero in it. Um, nevertheless, this uh, um, uh, Hoover did many more things, of course. I mean, he had his own publicists in-house. He had guys writing magazine stories about famous cases. Uh, he, he was just a, a master at uh, manipulating the message. Uh, unfortunately, uh, George Kelly didn't have such a publicity department on his behalf. Uh, and the stories that Hoover put out about Kelly took hold. Basically, uh, 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 Hoover wanted to make Machine Gun Kelly into the worst kind of villain possible so that his achievement in catching him and prosecuting him would seem all the greater. And uh, so he spread, uh, and part of it is, is still in the FBI lore. It's on their website. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, one, of the, one of the stories he spread was that when they finally uh, cornered Machine Gun Kelly in Memphis, that he dropped his weapon and cowered in the corner and said, don't shoot, G-Man, don't shoot. Um, it, it didn't happen like that. Uh, if you want to know how it happens, you can read the book. But uh, anyway, that, that then became the brand for the FBI. They're G-Men, right? They, they are to this day. Um, so as the years pass, the legend of Machine Gun Kelly continues to grow. Uh, and Roger Corman, who's the king of the B-movie makers, decides to make a movie about him uh, in 1958 cast this unknown actor known as Charles Bronson in the lead and makes Machine Gun Kelly out to be a psychopathic machine gunner and kidnapper uh, and uh, just basically also living under the thumb of his domineering wife. So anyway, that's the image of Machine Gun Kelly that persists to this day. Uh, there are still uh, uh, songs written about him, movies made about him, um, James Taylor's got a song uh, about Machine Gun Kelly, basically on that scenario. Um, but uh, it, it, the, the case really, in addition to all these other things that uh, it spawned, it also proved the, uh, the, the importance of branding and, uh, and, and media manipulation. Uh, Hoover's, Hoover's reputation, of course, soared in the first 10 years he was in office. And then, uh, as you probably know, began to sour as the years went on, uh, but nevertheless, he did uh, create the FBI as a basically sort of the first national police force uh, and uh, one of the most successful and um, uh, modern uh, at the time uh, and became the envy of the world. Um, so I think I have droned on long enough and if you would like to ask a question uh, since we are on C-SPAN, uh, please come to the microphone and uh, speak clearly into it. Yes, sir. Uh, two things. One, how much uh, ransom did uh, Urschel pay? And then the other question is, um, how did Machine Gun Kelly get his name, reputation? Did he actually kill anybody? Okay. Um, the ransom was... Uh, they took the ransom money out of the uh, oil company's account. It was two hundred thousand um, dollars. And the uh, second part of your question was, how did he get his reputation? Uh, curiously, it was created by both uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Catherine Kelly. Catherine uh, uh, George was a student of Harvey Bailey, and Harvey's credo was, you know, you got to stay under the radar. It doesn't do you any good to go shooting up a bank. The police are going to come after you. You don't want to hurt anybody because once you hurt somebody, that draws the law. So 
George was trying to prosecute his business in that fashion. In fact, he, he didn't like machine guns. Uh, he was kind of afraid of them. He liked to rob a bank with a concealed 38. He was a, you know, one of these charming, hail fellow, well-met Irishmen. He'd just go into the, into the bank incredibly well-dressed. Both he and Catherine were close horses, uh, very concerned about their image and their, and their fashion statements. He'd walk in, he'd open his jacket, show the 38, and ask the ladies behind the counter to just empty, the, uh, uh, empty their drawers into the satchel and uh, I'll be out of here with no problem. Uh, but that, but Catherine was, that wasn't good enough for Catherine. Catherine wanted to be married to the most famous criminal in all of America. So she started working on his reputation. She buys him a machine gun at a pawn shop in Fort Worth and uh, then starts spreading stories about him at speakeasies all over uh, Fort Worth and Dallas and Texas. And she was, a, she was in plenty of them. She would leave the spent shells behind and say that, you know, um, we've been down to the farm and George has been working on his, uh, his skills and he can shoot walnuts off a fence post or write his name on the side of a barn with this gun. Uh, and uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about it. And so the, the police officers down there who were, who always had, kind of had their eye on Kelly and would hang around in these bars uh, or speakeasies, uh, they started picking up on all this stuff that they were hearing about him. And when, um, when they first started chasing him and they, they discovered that it was George Kelly, um, the police in, uh, in Texas sent up this profile and said, said that he was a murderer and an and a, uh, expert machine gunner. And so that got on the wanted poster and then that got into the press and you know one thing led to another and suddenly we have this psychopathic machine gun Kelly. Um, and, but in fact, uh, to uh, to finish your question, uh, he, he's not known to have killed anybody. Uh, he did admit to, sh to shooting one guard, uh, wounding him in the shoulder uh, during a bank robbery, but uh, that's about all. He, he did participate in a number of bank robberies where people did get shot and get, did get killed, but um, the, when they would form up these bank robbing gangs, they, they would pull different people for different skill sets, and they really didn't uh, recruit Kelly and because of his uh, uh, viciousness or his skills with a weapon, they really liked him more for his uh, skills behind the wheel. I mean, he had been a, uh, uh, a gin runner and a bootlegger for almost 20 years. He, he knew all the back roads. He, he loved cars. He had uh, a 1932 18-cylinder Cadillac that that could that he had uh, customized by Al Capone's mechanic so that it could cruise at 100 miles an hour. Uh, you could never catch him once he was behind the <coughs> wheel. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, this was before the mania over the Second Amendment. Uh, what were gun control laws like at this time? And could regular people get a machine gun? Yes. Um, I'm not a. I'm not an expert on on weaponry or, or the laws about them, but I do believe that there were almost no laws pre preventing uh, uh, individuals from purchasing any kind of gun they wanted. Uh, in fact, the, the crime bill that this case spawned did include language that uh, restricted automatic weapons like machine guns, specifically to get at uh, the machine guns that were used in the Kansas City massacre at Union Station and the uh, uh, crimes that were reputedly committed by George Kelly. Uh, yes, actually, I think it was the, um, the following year, 1934 Firearms Act that outlawed uh, submachine guns and sawed-off shotguns as yes. a result of all this stuff that had been going on. Right. Um, right. Yeah, one, uh, one question and a comment. Uh, I understand that uh, George Kelly, when he was in Alcatraz, was one of the few actual penitents in a penitentiary that he wrote letters to Urschel and maybe some other um, people yeah. that uh, he victimized saying yes. nothing could be worth this. I'm so sorry, I'll bear this guilt for the rest of my life. Is that true? Yeah, that is absolutely true. He, he was a very literate man and he wrote uh, not only the letter you're referring to, which is considered to be uh, 
uh, one, one of the best uh, descriptions of what life is life be, like behind bars uh, that's ever been penned. Uh, and that is in the book. Uh, if you'd like to purchase a copy and, and, and read the whole thing for yourself. Uh, but yeah, he did. He was a constant letter writer, as are a lot of prisoners. But his, uh, uh, he was particularly uh, well-versed. He was smart. He would refer to uh, Greek mythology in some of his letters. And he wrote hundreds of letters to Catherine uh, that are just, um, you know, heart-rending love letters that, uh, you know, will almost bring you to tears, if not laughter. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was true. And they, when, when, when he was incarcerated at uh, Alcatraz, you know, they had a prison psychologist who uh, did an evaluation of all the prisoners and rated Kelly as extremely intelligent. Kelly enrolled in uh, correspondence courses from uh, the University of Southern California and had a little competition going with uh, Albert Bates, who was also in Al Alcatraz, as to who could do better. Um, and he, and he was a voracious reader and would um, do anything he could to sort of deal with the isolation of, of prison life. And uh, I'd like to beg your pardon, but I think it was Paul Muni starred in Scarface. Um, James Cagney had been and played a very similar role, also based on Capone, mm -hmm. in 1931 in the, the Public Enemy. Mm. You're right. But anyway, You're sorry, right. it's a great talk. You got me there. You know your film history. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of twists and turns. It seems like a lot of the topics dealt with uh, people who Howard Hughes knew. Do you have a Howard Hughes angle on any of this? I, I, Howard Hughes didn't make it in, although I, I should look for one. Do you think there is one? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, who did he, was any involved with making the movie Scarface, Howard Hughes? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, and he knew Thomas Slick, and of course he knew yeah. Herbert Hoover, and he was involved with the Hollywood censorship, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, he's a lot of, in Texas and oil, he had to know Herschel. Yeah. Yeah. So there must be some sort of... Yeah, Ur Urschel was, a, um, he was an active Democrat, and he was looking for, um, he had sent embassies, embassies to Washington to try to get FDR to bring, believe it or not, this is how much the oil business has changed, to bring some regulation to the oil business to help protect uh, the wildcatters who were being driven out of business by the big oil companies back east who were driving the price so low that nobody could make any money. Anything else? Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, and okay. folks, just a reminder, there is uh, a book sale, in, one level up at the Archives Bookstore, so we'll meet you up there in a couple minutes. And I'll be happy to sign any copy with any kind of verbiage you would like. Mm -hmm.